And we're live. Right. Welcome back to another episode of the Cycling Physios. My name's Tim. Uh, Bianca is hiding in the background tonight. She's monitoring the chat box. It'll just be myself and John on screen. And we are joined tonight by John Wiggins. And we're following on from our aerodynamics theme. We've had a couple of previous webinars talking about the background to uh, cycling biomechanics in terms of aerodynamics and what aerodynamics is all about and testing for that. And John is now continuing our theme and looking at real world testing. And we're incredibly privileged to have John with us tonight because John has a wealth of experience working through uh, three Olympic cycles as a sports scientist and cycling coach and is now looking at real world cycling with Aerolab. So I'm gonna hand the mic over to John to tell us a little bit more about what he's doing now and his background to how he's got to where we are now and give us a bit more information about real world aerodynamic testing. So John, I'll add your screen and you can take Thank it away. You. Yeah, I'll just enlarge that a little. Yeah, perfect, okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tim and Bianca, uh, for the invite today uh, to your webinar. It's always a pleasure to to reach out and uh, and to and to support you guys uh, with a fantastic initiative. Um, it's also um, a pleasure to be able to speak about real world aerodynamics because that's really a passion uh, and definitely the future where everybody's talking about a lot about aerodynamics at the moment. Um, I've had an extensive uh, career journey through cycling, um, working the last 20 years as a, at the highest levels of the sport with over 12 years in uh, Olympic cycles, so three Olympics for Belgium cycling. Um, with a background in biomechanics and fluid dynamics, I've been worked at British Swimming. Um, so yeah, this some um, 20 years later, <laughs> I, I came out of the Federation and I worked um, after Rio for a performance cycling clothing brand in aerodynamics and bike fitting, and uh, still work in projects, uh, consultancy projects in uh, Formula One, uh, motocross, MotoGP, equestrian sport, which is quite alternative in that aspect, and obviously cycling and cycling aerodynamics. Um, here, here are the topics that I, that I wish to run through this evening, um, or wherever we are in the world listening to this. Um, and for some of you, new ideas, and um, for, I'm sure, many, many conf uh, confirmation of the way in which you work or wish to work in the future. So I hope I enlighten you on that and uh, the ideas behind it and the technology and how far we are with the technology these days. And the future of cycling is continuously accelerating in both innovative manufacturing through R&D and to establishing more accurate training tools and training methods with more and more skilled experts coming on the scene. So that's that's also very exciting for the sport. And uh, so these are exciting times ahead of head for aerodynamics. And we will cover the following. So uh, where is the aero trend steering towards a golden standard? That's what everybody tries to strive for. Where is the golden standard in real world aerodynamics, which is all pretty new for everybody? Um, who benefits from this type of tech and limiting factors? Control the controllable, I always say, repeat the repeatable. Um, that's very much common uh, sense throughout all types of testing, whether what field testing, physiologically testing or whatever um, in sports science and embracing new patent technology uh, led by world-class university research. So yeah, like I said, it's exciting times. Um, moving on, what and who is, um, setting the trend um, and there is a lot of competition out there at the moment um, but what we try to try to establish this evening is a little bit about um, who's doing what and uh, what we can take out of it from ourselves as bike fitters or aerodynamicists or physiologists or biomechanists um, so it's testing either indoor uh, lab testing or outdoor field testing repeatability and consistency using accurately calibrated tools is key to successful test results. Estimations or assumptions are not repeatable. Um, so I'll, I'll take you quickly back to 2011, um, when the patents finished with SRM and along came many competitive power meters onto the market or statistical algorithms, uh, estimators on the market that were cheaper 
And basically, they threw away the principles of retesting and day-to-day -day accuracy and power of data. And price over accuracy in marketing won hands down and still, and still does. Um, maybe, maybe changes are again on the horizon. But there's more to come on that. And definitely, we'll touch a little bit on that um, on these slides. This is true also, but somewhat in the reverse with mobile aerodynamic tools. And what I mean by that is, firstly, many gadgets have entered the market, um, either as timing systems or estimation devices. So it's very important to understand what you have in your hands to quantify as, as a test, as accurate, reliable, repeatable, and consist consistent instruments. Um, so power is a dominating factor in aer any aerodynamic equation. So the more uh, accurate data that we can uh, that we can acquire um, and the more repeatable accuracy at high speed will determine how granular adaptations to aerodynamics uh, you can analyze basically um, so here you can see for example here are a couple of slides that we will go a little bit deeper into and you can see uh, very clearly the raw data on the left side and how the process data is and the accuracy and the wind speed wind your angles and the type of speed that the rider is is uh, is riding at, and uh, the power that they deliver, and then the, the at this at this point of time is a process data of CDA. Um, so moving moving on, this is the accuracy of the data acquisition is reliant on the high speed sampling signals of the measuring instrument. So when we focus on the air resistance as a dominant dominating force factor in cycling then we see that every part of the formula is crucial in interpreting consistency in data so it goes without saying that instruments that only measure half of the equation or instruments that can't process a high sampling rate are limited in the understanding of any granular analysis or small changes such as helmets fabrics um, body shifting, um, any cockpit and instability or stability, and comprehending sustainability over time and estimated energy consumption gains and losses. So it is definitely an area that, um, from the standpoint of technology, so it's Aerolab, um, they are very keen to implement and show off this technology because it's been a lot of credit to a lot of the team, how they've developed this over, over a few years. Um, of extensive research and work and being able to plot this, bring this all into one very smart, small little instrument that works very, very closely and cleverly and calibrated from a wind tunnel. So your energy efficiency is determined by, and I always, and we, we speak always about shape, form and power. Obviously power always has to be in the equation. And basically you can't, we always say that you can't buy a helmet or suit and um, to make you faster a fast helmet or suit however you can optimize your shape to make the helmet and suit fast or faster for you so for every bike fitter physiologist physiotherapist coach biomechanist aerodynamicist out there and there are several common areas of importance in understanding performance over comfort and this is currently still a massive void between expert labs wind tunnels velodromes where the athletes are positioned into an either extreme unsustainable position or unstable uncomfortable position so the equation of power this is a dominating factor for efficiency and the objective is to overcome the resistances with more effective shape that both has power comfort and ultimately going faster further and longer um, so playing with shaping riders cutting them out placing them in cfd models power acquisitions and then replicating this in velodrome conditions have all become the norm uh, in trying to replicate the ultimate performance outdoors. However, the real world still complements, uh, complicates these uh, CFD modeling or computational models with many variables such as CRR and YOR, which are quite often not in the equation or taken out of the equation just from the uh, variable complications that there are. Um, so we see that molding your body to manage the performance is super important and we see the athlete has three big tasks basically on their hands to overcome variable resistances and there's working together with their bike fitter and physiotherapist to complement their shaping and form becoming uh, basically becoming slippery and uh, what we see as slippery very easy in fluid dynamics to understand that but that, and obviously there comes an added uh, accent of buoyancy in, in fluid dynamics, which is totally different, and an oxidization, 
um, and the way that the athlete sits and slides through the water. But we do see that also, and we like to um, comprehend and use the terminology slippery also with cyclists, um, because there are cyclists that can mold their bodies very small, very narrow, and some are more natural than others, more stable than others, more sustainable in focusing long durations, staying still, and still obtaining a massive performance output at the end of the day. Um, so th these are these are key points basically that I've worked on uh, over many many years, and and uh, they they are valid points that always keep coming back now, even when we see the this the this technology that's coming onto the market uh, with such high accuracy. So basically, there, this is eight tips in in aero for understanding your athlete's sustainability, whether it's in a controlled environment or even more so going outdoors in the real world. As further, faster, forever, we always say that the three Fs that are trying to, what we're trying to realize as an adaptation in the athlete. Um, so the number one is definitely performance efficiency. At the end of the day, we, we want to ride bigger gears. Um, we want to go further, faster. Uh, with uh, more uh, energy uh, saving, so lesser CDA or lesser resistance. Our, the comfort and the pressure are super important, but, out, but are outweighed by performance at the end of the day. So even though the athletes are quite often not so comfortable, a big difference between somebody that's doing a four kilometer team, team pursuit that's 70 kilometers an hour from a standing start, or somebody that is uh, on an Iron Ironman Hawaii, for example, that comfort obviously comes into a, a different role play. Um, but balance, um, stability, fixing the hip angles and fixing the hip position is super important. And you see that with manufacturers, how they design their frames, the steepness of the frame, how they position the angle of the hip. Um, and then obviously gravity and the center of mass in the body position, how the rider is balanced with his proportion of weight and balance. Um, and how, how he creates a light weight, basically, with lesser pressure in the front end of the bike. Um, stability and symmetry play a massive role in anything with biomechanics and aerodynamics. Um, effectiveness of, of, of basically all the above, I've done them a little bit in the order of the ranking that I see it, and then bringing that across as a torque. Um, so torque is crucial in understanding that we don't have any torque losses um, because of impingement areas or areas where the, the rider becomes restricted. Um, and then basically the two E's, the, the energy efficiency and gains and losses in watts. And, um, and, and that is basically what I see as my top eight. I always call it top eight because we work in Olympic cycles. The, the top eight athletes is, um, in the Olympics is super important. Um, and uh, that's uh, yeah. So we we try to I try to steer with that with the with the eights, and then with accurate data acquisition, uh, real world aerodynamics is a very sought after means of um, validating equipment. Um, so with high speed instruments in aerodynamics, this is opening doors for manufacturers, fitters, and pro teams federations to access uh, assess and validate how equipment is interpreted in the real world. Uh, this is complicated material, and highly regarded engineering data companies are, are joining together to complement each other, um, such as high-speed power meters, uh, error instrumentation, um, in supporting how either rider or equipment performs in the real world. And you can see here, I split it up in three main uh, topics, and that's how we see it as a manufacturing company in aerodynamics, is that basically we see manufacturers um, uh, as a separate um, identity in aerodynamics for fitters and teams and federations. Now, obviously, the teams and fitters and, and federations, they they collaborate quite often. Manufacturers, on the other hand, have quite often, until now, listened to fitters and teams and then adapted their products. We see now with the technology how it is now, that definitely towards rolling resistance, types of tire compounds. Um, the, the wheels, the compatibility with the tires, the frame, the designs of the frames, the clothing, helmets. Uh, this type of real world is uh, such an important validation for making any future or development of R&D within the manufacturers actually going with new products and actually being able to prove to the teams and federations, this is the direction we wish you to go in and not the other way around. Um, so yeah, uh, that is for fitters, obviously, an optimal uh, biomechanics, a stable cockpit, sustainable positioning. Lower is not always faster, so uh, we're talking about efficiency. 
um, breathability, breathing, um, how restricted you are in the way that you can breathe, uh, hip impingements, obviously hip angle restrictions, pedal setups, which is complicated, um, shoe uh, and foot stability, hands and forearms, uh, super important, head positioning, obviously. So a lot of topics, a lot of areas with this type of real world technology that we, with high speed sampling, uh, sample rates that we can actually see that and evaluate that. Um, so this, what I always say is failing to plan is planning to fail. Um, we have uh, three main areas of implementing successful real world testing. And that is basically over equipment, test protocols and being prepared to record as super important as uh, anybody in the field, anybody that's a bike fitter, anybody in uh, specifically in aerodynamics, um, these type of field testing. So you really need to know what you have, like I said, in your hands. Uh, the engineering grade that you have, the, the pattern, the technology, uh, the reasoning behind it, behind it the research, the wit and that it's wind tunnel calibrated, so you have your accuracy. Um, the high sampling rates, so we're, we're sampling with an Aerolab, for example, anything more than 40 hertz, um, with all the different sensors. Um, and uh, yeah, basically a, a little bit restricted in, at the moment how power meters are working. So they're working anything from one hertz to four hertz. So you can see that uh, the sampling rate there is a lot lesser. And like I said, there are companies uh, uh, jumping on board basically for uh, introducing their new high power, high um, frequency sampling rate power meter. And then obviously measuring, being able to measure your and the CDA and the rolling resistance is super key um, in a, such an engineering grade instrument. And then test protocols. Basically, controlled safe, safe test area, repeatability, consistency, and engineering support, and being prepared is super, super important. So any uh, bike fits um, has to be done, and the physiotherapist, so you understand if you're symmetric or where your asymmetry is. Uh, tire pressure accuracy and the rollout, uh, with the weather conditions, obviously, and the air density, and then uh, how you're going to record um, and obviously then the, the small things like battery replacement, so you're never stuck and the, the test uh, can be brought to its end and completed successfully. Um, so this is a little bit of an idea and uh, give you, it's quite an, um, a broad look onto how we see that uh, power is, uh, the powerful knowledge of correct measuring um, is super important. With reference to the C, this CSV uh, file is how intricate work the technology handles, CRR, air densities, accelerations, GPS, and basically equaling to, at the end, um, a CDA. Um, and all that credit really goes to um, Professor Chris Morton um, as an aerospace engineer that he's done the groundbreakingly uh, work and founded a uh, co-founder of Aerolab Tech. Um, and they did a lot of their research work over the last three years and their painted technology of being able to equate basically for the CRR and the yaw angles into this small instrument um, has offered and uh, not only leading cycling teams, but federations, manufacturers, leading aerodynamicists, but also automotive manufacturing. So to acquire the technology for real world aerodynamics. So it's, uh, you can see it's in a very extensive and very um, uh, broad look on uh, an, an, an intricate way of working and how many different data files are actually, uh, the acquisition of data coming into the, into the unit is, uh, is amazing. And this will give you uh, a little bit of the idea of uh, the R&D pioneering and validating changes that we have uh, uh, in the market today and uh, companies that are reaching out and we're being able to confirm and validate and work together. And you see that UCI world teams also, they like to be in their comfort zone. So uh, luck, that's a good thing because a controlled environment, they already have a lot of data. And that's basically con uh, continuing their controlled environment testing. But with that data, then very cleverly, then going outside, keeping testing with their, within their comfort zone, knowing exactly what they've been doing, and then being able to take that data and go further in uh, outdoor and validate that. So um, we've seen some very smart development opportunities and, and uh, projects uh, within the World Tour teams at the moment. Um, there's a lot of uh, brainstorming going on, on, and especially with federations coming up to the Olympics. And uh, making the difference with quantifying their database in the real world, basically. 
uh, race recons, uh, positioning or equipment changes, restrictions within the sponsoring that they have. So they have to, base, uh, quite a lot of the teams, quite a lot of the riders have to make the most of the type of helmet that they're working with or the type of suit. So they, they really have to learn to make that product faster for them. Um, and, and all those changes that go on during a season that's very complicated logistically for a team. So nothing is taken for granted anymore with this type of uh, tech in-house uh, that they can use worldwide wherever they are. They, they have the technology with them and they can, like I said, do the re race recons or check areas of equipment. If they say, look, we don't trust this type of wheel setup or this helmet, do we, can we change? And what is the best setup for this type of air density? So yeah, there's... Uh, we can see that uh, more and more that consider consolidating the engineering uh, greatness, basically what we're what we're achieve achieving in this technology, and uh, being able to demonstrate that and show that off with the, the teams that are pretty uh, wide-eyed and wowed by what um, incredible technology and uh, data that they're being able to achieve now with that accuracy. Um, so this was a little bit of an example I gave from a velodrome test example to show you the, the power of such technology in the real world. Um, firstly, going to a team um, in the, within their comfort zone and expressing, yeah, they did. They made some small changes for this one, which is a good example. Um, they only changed the pads and uh, narrow three centimeters, even though the CDA outcome was not so bad. Um, there was a note that they were shifting quite a bit on the saddle. The rider was not so comfortable. Um, so they made we made some changes basically, and uh, we changed the pads. So we went three millimeters higher, and uh, they kept the bars at the same angle, and the CDA dropped um, to 0 0.202. Um, and then uh, what was interesting was they they tilted the bars um, because there is a trend that the riders want to get behind their hands, um, and they put a seven and a half millimeter spacer. Um, the bars, not the pads, but under the bars and lifted the whole front end up, uh, which when you see the, the measurement, then it's actually increased um, um, point, point 0.204. So yeah, it was intriguing to see that. And we quickly made an, a smart adjustment knowing that. Um, we took the spacing out from under the bars and we put spacing in between the pads and, and the bars, so we lifted just the front end of the rider. We, we didn't move the whole section. Um, and uh, we opened the hip angles of the rider as well and actually created more comfort, more power, and he dropped under point two as well. So that was uh, an intriguing one. And the team, then they, they like challenges. The team, then they throw at you uh, ideas. And we knew the baseline then from that rider. So we used the same uh, baseline, which you can see as the blue line uh, in session six. This is final TT position with the aero helmet. And we went into same position, but remove helmet from the, um, uh, the visor. Um, and then in the same position, but with a standard road helmet and glasses. And then you can see um, very easily the differences in uh, CDA value. Um, so that was that was impressive to be able to see that granu those granular changes. Um, and we can then bring that very smartly to outdoor to confirm that. And um, then also the team, it's a complicated process because obviously you come outdoors and you have different wind speeds. You have wind your angles, uh, which are playing a different role on the on the instrument on the on the way that the rider works. And we do so. We execute some out and back testing, or we can execute a a free ride where they ride from A to B, but preferably out and backs until they get used to protocols and they become various uh, consistent. You see, with this rider here, uh, from laps three, four, and five, he became very very consistent with his CDA. Um, with his power output and and speed as well, so that was um, the the riders they they start to learn how to use the equipment correctly within different wind variables. Um, so that was one second. Yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, smart and exciting times ahead. Um, also, to look out for the different opportunities, there will be a lot more media opportunities with more aero courses. Um, there will be it will be opportunities also to enable a fully fledged member of uh, becoming a part of the IBFI International Bike Fitters Institute. 
um, as an aero expert fitter. So yeah, there are there are going to be lots and lots of opportunities to experience and be able to work and learn to work and be um, driven and steered by our, our engineering team um, to become an expert in the field of aerodynamics outdoors. Um, so yeah, this is this gave you it gives you a little bit of an insight of where we are um, at the at today and we can. De definitely uh, learn more and become an expert in real world aerodynamics and cycling. That would be a fantastic goal to see a lot more people coming on board and and uh, exchanging ideas and becoming a very smart community together. Um, so that was yeah. Thank you very much. That was uh, a, a well a quick introduction through what we are doing and how we are busy in the real world aerodynamics. Um, and yeah, we can go over to questions and answers. I think. Excellent. Thanks, John. I'll, uh, I'll just take that your screen back down again, back just to you and I. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that was very interesting to see how, obviously, technology is moving on. And uh, I mean, that's something certainly I've, I've seen in the, the coaching world within even just age groupers is, you know, 2020 was an opportunity for a lot of people just to really geek out on trying to improve positions, you know, when they're not racing. There's been a yeah. lot of investment in, you know, other ways to, to find that almost free speed, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. With, from, from our point of view as, as bike fitters and maybe sort of physios in the bike fitting world is how do you see us maybe applying this in our bike fitting process? Where do you see that kind of um, that role for maybe making some changes, send them away, test that, come back? How, how does that work in, in your world? Yeah, I think it's a, that's a, it's a good question. I think it's a very smooth transition, actually, because of the user-friendly uh, application. Um, I think that is super important that you can make small adjustments. You can confirm that indoor on your, on your valid, on your testing, that your established test protocol that you do now. And you can go outdoors and see the sustainability over time and see how comfortable they are in that position. And then you can either work on the, the body dynamics, the way that they have become more flexible, can mold their body into a better shape, and then come back and then have a better referral in the way that they can improve their positioning. Or maybe they are sitting already optimal. And it's also possible. Maybe they've had a crash and uh, they're, they're a little bit asymmetric and they should be a little bit tight on one side and being able to loosen up and, and changing or if they want to change, if they're changing crank lengths, for example, and they want to validate that and see how much more efficient they become. And if they have a better CBA and a, and a more open uh, hip angle, for example, uh, quite similar to how we we showed that that the the bike fitter can to confirm that and can see that in any power gains or losses, um, yeah. So that I think there are some fantastic opportunities there. I think that you've basically from going from a lab and being confirmed in indoors and seeing um, and and putting get, getting that data from outdoors in the real world. I think, yeah. Yeah, that's it. It's, it's the applicability of this, isn't it? And it's, it's all very well having this very clean clinical lab-based data, but mm -hmm. exactly what you were saying in, in your talk there is, is when you start throwing in all the real-world environment stuff, yeah. um, it, it can get very messy. Um, yeah, sure. That, um, what do we then sort of test on rolling roads, or do you try and get somewhere very, very flat or a, a Stand, standard gradient or consistent gradient what kind of surfaces do you tend to try and use in the real world yeah um again that's complements to the the technology that you have in your hands because it's very dependent on the how the technology can handle that so for example that with an aerolab uh, we have a very high engineering grade gps system it's not a that standard gps that you would have in a in a garment for example um, so with that um, high engineering uh, grade of uh, instrument, we can have rolling terrain. Um, for example, we tested with a world tour team and um, we had some bridges in their uh, loop, um, free ride loop that we were doing on their aero testing. And uh, it was very clear, we had a yaw angle and uh, on the bridge we could see the, the CDA dropping um, and this was just purely because of shelter, sheltering. So the lower part of the body, the lower limbs were not in the calculation. And uh, so just to show you, 
how important it is to actually understand your also where you're testing your test location um and uh, the effects of in on that terrain as well but um yeah we can uh, it, it's not a, it's not an issue for terrain or um being able to test in in any type of well i wouldn't say as long as the speeds are uh, above 15 kilometers an hour we can test anywhere basically yeah. Yeah. And i suppose that somewhat links into a thought i had with that previous question which is that bike fitting is very much of an evolving process. We're not trying to get someone in just a position and that's it. See you later. You can stay yeah. like that for the next however many years. It's about um, continually monitoring, adapting, changing and, and reacting. Do you then see maybe differences in terms of what you're looking to achieve depending on race terrain and, and race courses? How are you using it for that? Yeah. Um, because everybody is individual, um, it's very much uh, uh, an, an opportunity to see how stable and how sustainable the rider is, um, and then you can start to work on more granular aspects. So, in the way that uh, is the helmet, can we change to a smaller helmet? How much movement does the rider have in his head? Um, is he moving around a lot when he's riding? Is he putting his head down, which is quite a lot of a trend at the moment? So, definitely, a, a shorter helmet is then better. Um, so these type of aspects, is it what type of air density is it? Is it for a short sleeve uh, skin suit or is it a long sleeve skin suit that they need? What what types of speeds are they getting up to in the terrain? And then also then it comes down to also tire pressures, rolling resistance, the type of how compatible the wheels are in the frames of the bikes. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, there are always lots of different choices that have to be made within that. So it's a, it is yeah. a complicated, a complicated um, topic, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I suppose as we're, we're thinking about this real world field testing versus maybe our more traditional wind tunnels, um, do we, is this the end of wind tunnels? Are, are we moving away from that? Or do you still think that we will see a, a blending of the, the two methodologies there? Yeah, absolutely not. Um, in, in actual fact, I think it's very complementary because uh, our, all our systems are wind tunnel calibrated and Professor Chris Morton uh, manufactures or builds wind tunnels for research. Uh, so um, we uh, we see wind tunnels very much as uh, the, the start of any R&D project. Uh, and that means anything from fabrics, helmet designs, manufacturing, frame manufacturing, a confirmation basically of the CFD modeling that the manufacturers bring on. And then uh, what is super, super important is the, the next transition, which at the moment there's a large void. And that's where we're trying to educate. And that is bring all that data, all that understanding and science um, into the real world. So that's, uh, yeah, great. Uh, it's a fantastic opportunity for uh, all around, even the controlled environments in the velodrome. Um, the, the Aerolab Tech, for example, has a, a velodrome mode. Um, so there are, there are many, many opportunities there if you, have, for example, uh, very windy conditions, or um, there. Are, it's really very in Holland, for example. The Holland has a lot of uh, different wind variables, uh, which could be make it uh, a bit uh, tricky for testing out. So, velodrome testing is a controlled environment test that was very, very interesting. And then taking that understanding of that to the outdoors in and very extreme wind variables and seeing the yaw and how the either the bike or the rider is being pulled by the by the yaw as well so that's uh, that's an interesting one yeah. and that's, that comes back to your points around stability as well absolutely uh, all very well having a, a beautifully aerodynamic position in the wind tunnel but if you can't stay stable when you're getting buffeted by side winds then again yeah. it's uh, it's not going to stand up, isn't it? Um, yeah. So with all this data <coughs> that we're getting from the, the tech, how much do you still use either a Mark One eyeball and just looking at the rider or maybe using video footage to support some of your decision making? Do you still do you still use this? Yeah, it's, I think that it's always important because you have the mental aspects with the riders. Um, mm. So what quite it's a it's a very similar one to riders have a a tendency to like certain helmets to like the look of the type of visor that they have and be able to hide behind that visor um, it's quite intriguing to be able to show them sometimes it's actually faster with your, just your sunglasses than than a visor 
Um, but yeah, that's uh, so. I think I think it's uh, it's it's good. It's not something to throw away. Um, video analysis is always very intriguing, and we've been looking into that to be able to um, collaborate and uh, and introduce that a little bit like a dark fish system where we do have the video or the photos next to it. I think that's very important for bike fitting. That's not initially on our priority list. Yeah. Um, it is. It can be. It could be down the road if the demand from the fitters say that they really need that. Um, so yeah, definitely. Yeah, I don't. I don't think. I'm never one for throwing anything that we've used or or confirmed uh, away. I don't. I don't believe in that. I think it's just adding to the expertise and the skills of everybody. Yeah. I see. We've still got to blend the art and the science, haven't we? And we're bringing yeah. more and more science into the equation, um, but there is still the art element. And like you just said, there it's the psychology of the rider and being able to read maybe even the sort of um, you know the comfort level and, and psychological psychological state of the rider in, sure. in those different positions, isn't it? So yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just looking to see if we've got any more questions coming through. Um, this was one that came through on Twitter, um, a quite a simple one that Bianca's just put in uh, the wink there. So what's best, lower or narrow? Uh, we, obviously, I get a lot of people coming to me for bike fits and they I want to go low, I want to go low. And we we'll often need to try and educate them. That's not always the case, which is what you said in your presentation. Yeah. But do you want to expand on that one? Yeah, I think it's a good example that I gave. Um, we went uh, narrow is always better in aerodynamics, uh, obviously, unless you come down to tire. Uh, but that's to do with the that's a patch, and that's different than rolling resistance and pressure, and that's totally different. Um, but in the way that the body and the body shape, and what I mentioned about being slippery, um, obviously, frontal area is super important, and uh, it's not always lower that's better. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, it is it is an easy one, um, yeah. and and I think that it's true to word with uh, with Dan Bigham, uh, for example. Dan is, is is pushing and pushing harder in his development, and when you see the bar, the bars, the they might not look the nicest, but definitely when it comes down to uh, CDA, bit being narrow is better. Yeah, and as you said in your presentation as well, it's it's. The, the the body has to be able to become slippy or slippery itself sure. uh, so it may well be that you have a position you would like to achieve but yeah. that may take you know months if not even years to adapt your body into it i mean i've got a, a chap that i've been working with for the last few years uh, an ironman athlete and you know it is taking us years to train his body to get yeah. into the position that he would really like to be in sure uh, so, i just put my lights on a minute for you better. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So um, another question just come through there. So what are the general aero trends right now? You touched on this a little bit, but do you want to maybe sort of summarize um, where you see things going at the moment? Yeah, I, I, I think to really the we're very dependent in uh, in manufacturing from aerodynamics we're very dependent on power meters so the more accurate high speed power meter that we can we can use uh, the more we can do with our with the data acquisition so um sampling you know high rates a uh, high hertz sampling rate for example on track um on the velodrome now running into tokyo super important for the sprinters and even more so now in a way for the team pursuit because they're up to such high speeds um, so power, the power meter is obviously crucial um, for that. Um, that is, the trends that we see are um, getting becoming narrower. Um, the, the way that we're measuring, um, I think that we're going more and more um, towards this type of technology. Uh, with even we even even more better high en engineering grade technology that's implemented. In, in, in that uh, the way that we measure aerodynamics and wind speeds and your so um, I, I, I think that we at the moment where we are with fabrics and aerodynamics I think we're quite limited uh, I, I, I think there's still some fantastic work that's being done um, but I, I, I think that what, what we've seen with the suits even from 2012 with the British team um, right the way through to 2016 and uh, how how those suits were then from the track brought into um, time trial 
on the road was uh, I, I think that's that's a good thing. Helmet design is also another big one um, because it's very very individual and in how they use that helmet to make them faster. Um, so yeah, it's uh, manufacturing frame manufacturing. That's the intriguing one. Uh, I think there's still a lot of work to be done with that. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, at least in sort of my world, the sort of triathlon side of things, there's uh, a little bit more ability to adapt and play and not be restricted by by UCR. Yeah, uh, great. That's uh, that's been a really interesting talk. So so thank you, John, for for developing this uh, this theme that we've had going on recently. Um, do you want to just share where people can find out a bit more about Aero Lab and maybe a bit more about you? Um, your sort of social media or your websites? Yeah, um, they, it's quite easy with me. Uh, it's Coach Wiggins. I think I'm on Twitter, um, on Instagram. If anybody wants to see some some of the wacky ideas that we, we play around with and do in testing and field testing. Uh, and then obviously in LinkedIn as well. I think it's also under Coach Wiggins or John Wiggins. Um, but And uh, then again with Aerolab Tech is uh, just aerolabtech.com or uh, .tech, sorry. Um, so uh, yeah, and there it's important for us to, uh, to have a look and run through uh, the YouTube uh, films. We have uh, quite an extensive YouTube channel uh, and there you'll be able to see all the types of testing that you can do and how the field testing and run through the whole, all the protocols basically that we do um, and uh, the design of the technology, the, the, the background, the, 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 the co-founders. Um, yeah, so there's, um, that's on the Aerolab Tech on the YouTube channel. Great stuff. Thanks very much. We'll take some links in the uh, the descriptions box for, for this video later on as well. Yeah. Uh, on on uh, our social media. Right. I think that's all our questions we've had come through. So I just want to say again, thank you very much for giving us your time this evening, John. It's uh, good to catch up. I haven't actually yeah, you since uh, all the, uh, the COVID kicked off. It was uh, summer before that, wasn't it, when we had you over at the university? Yeah. Uh, our conference. Yeah. Blimey. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah good, to, good to actually talk again, and uh, I look forward to seeing more from you over the next sort of coming months as we're heading out towards uh, the Olympics. Yeah, no, great stuff. Thank you very much for having okay. me. Thanks so much, everybody, and please make sure you subscribe to see our next videos coming up. Uh, I think we've got another one coming out in a, another couple of weeks' time. So Bianca handles most of our social media, um, so look out for the posts coming from her. Okay, thanks so much. See you later. Thank you. Bye bye.